comes to the historical Jesus, and the mythicists are completely right to the extent that there are things recorded about Jesus in the New Testament that did not happen. That doesn't mean he didn't exist. It just means that these things didn't happen. When you crucify somebody, what happens to the body? I looked up every reference I could find in every Greek and Latin author from the ancient world about crucifixion. What they virtually always say is that the bodies were left on the crosses to decompose on the crosses so that the birds would eat them. Did Josephus write that? And if he wrote it, did he write all of it? In this paragraph, he says Jesus was the Messiah, and he says that he was raised from the dead on the third day to fulfill the scriptures. You know Josephus never became a Christian follower of Jesus. He, we have his autobiography. And Philo doesn't mention him, or Pliny the Elder, well, that shows that he didn't exist. <laughs> oh! What? It shows he didn't have all those followers. <laughs> so do we do we have any physical evidence or any primary sources going to the life during the time of his life of Jesus? No. Or Dr. Ehrman, good to see you again. Hey, how you doing? Good. So let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to talk to you about the historical Jesus. The conversation between mythicists and historicists is still happening today. Richard Carrier wrote a, a pretty interesting book about Jesus not existing at all and just being a mythological character. However, I think the uh, kryptonite in, Carrier, in Carrier's uh, philosophy is the Nazareth. I think this is the strongest argument for historicists is, is that why would you want to make somebody from Nazareth, but he has to be from Bethlehem to be tied to David. And now they'll say to that, well, there's a quote from one of the gospels saying he should come from Nazareth. But the whole thing is just confusing. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is why I'm a historicist. However, I do want to know about the historical Jesus and what can we definitively know about him? If you take apart the mythology, for example, we know Herod didn't kill innocent babies. We know that he probably didn't get sold for 30 shekels, just like Joseph did. A lot of this stuff is drawn from the Old Testament. But if you take all that away, what are you left with? What do we know for sure about Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, frankly, in, in scholarly circles, the conversation is not going on. It never has, really. I mean, it's not, so of, of the thousands of, scholars I know who work on th these materials. I, I don't know anybody really talking about, <laughs> but, but, but I know that people on the internet are and that uh, people uh, find uh, Richard's uh, book uh, convincing and, uh, and other books. And so, you know, certainly needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed. Um, the um, scholars, scholars across the board um, who are actually you know, trained in this field. I mean, there, there just, it just isn't because the, the evidence is so overwhelming. It's not even, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking, you know, astronomers, is there still a conversation about whether the moon is made of cheese or not? You know, because <laughs> I just read that, I mean, you know, I've met, I've met people who said that the earth is hollow yeah, um, yeah. and um, who generally, I mean, you know, generally believe it, but there, this is not, it's not a discussion uh, among uh, physicists and astronomers and it's not a discussion because we know it's not hollow <laughs> we know it <laughs> so so um so there's a difference between kind of what happens you know, like on the internet and popular audiences and what happens in in scholars That's scholars right. whether they're atheist or christian or jew or whatever they are who study this stuff um are pretty unified not just that jesus existed but that you can say some things uh that pretty much definitely there's some things definitely just about everybody agrees with. And then there's a lot of things people disagree with. And a lot of it's for the reasons that you're pointing out that you, when it comes to the historical Jesus, and the mythicists are completely right in the, to the extent that there are things recorded about Jesus in the New Testament that did not happen. Um, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. That doesn't mean he didn't exist. It just means that these things didn't happen. Just sure. like we have stories about George Washington that didn't happen. And I hear stories about me all the time that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it's like, so, Art, you know, I don't exist. <laughs> maybe I don't. <laughs> um, 
So, but but there are certain things that just about everybody agrees on. They agree that Jesus was, they agree that he lived in the early part of the first century of the Common Era, that he grew up in Galilee, that he was Jewish, that he followed Jewish laws and Jewish customs, that he was some kind of Jewish teacher, that he had followers, that he, um, uh, you know, so I'm there. There's a list. There's a. Those are kind of basic things. Yeah. But there's a, there's a long list of specifics that just about everybody agrees with. I mean that that he had brothers. Uh, that um, that he he came from a poor place in in Nazareth. That he was on a preaching itinerant preaching ministry. That he preached about a. Uh, they, he preached about uh, what he understood to be the true interpretation of the Torah. That he had disagreements with other Jewish teachers. That the last week of his life, he went to Jerusalem, and that something happened there. He got arrested, and that he was crucified. I mean, though, just about everybody who actually wants to look at the evidence without bias, or just like right. you know, you just want to look at the evidence. You just want to know. Yeah. And people like me, I mean, I. I really don't have a stake in this. My, uh, I, it, my life would be more interesting if Jesus was a myth, because then I could say, oh, boy, I could write all sorts of things. Just right. like more, my life would be more interesting if I'd become a born again Christian again. <laughs> yeah, right. You make I mean, a lot of money too. <laughs> so Dude, it's you're not rich if you did that. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't. I don't. In, in that sense, I really don't have a stake in this. But you know. just you know, you look at the evidence. So those are things that the people would agree on. And those are all good points. And I just wanted to get that out the way because I also want to. Uh, look at other sources outside of the biblical text. So you got the Celsus and you got who, which the Talmud, I think is borrowing from Celsus saying that his father was a Roman soldier named Pantera. Is, is there anything to this? And it seems like the Jews took this pretty seriously. They put it in their Talmud. They said it was quoted by Elizier Ben Harkanis. So they're using the source that we know from Celsus, but they're also saying that Elizier Ben Harkanis said this as well in the first century. So I guess there's something to this. What do you think about this being? Is this is there anything to this, or is this just nonsense? Um, so we don't really know the circumstances of Jesus' uh, birth. Um, everything indicates that people thought it was unusual. <laughs> In the New Testament, he, you know, two of the Gospels say that he was born of a virgin, uh, and so that's unusual. Uh, uh, there are suggestions in Mark. And the in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, that there were rumors that he was born out of wedlock. Uh, at least there's, there's suggestions about that in the Gospel of John. There's suggestions in the Gospel of Mark that his mother, as an adult, didn't really understand what was going on with him. Uh, and so there are all sorts of interesting interesting things. Yeah. Uh, but what is usually thought that I think is almost certainly right is that there at least were stories about Jesus having an unusual birth. And it might, may have been that there were stories about him being born out of wedlock. Uh, and that, and some people have taken that as evidence that, in fact, that's what happened. That, that Mary, whoever Mary was, that she had gotten pregnant, and that Christians later, knowing about this, this birth, uh, said, well, actually, uh, yeah, but it's because she was born of a virgin. He was born of a virgin. She was a virgin. So it's not that she had sex, but she wasn't, you know, so this is what happened. So that's, I think that's plausible, although I don't think there's a way to demonstrate one way or the other. Um, yeah. And a, another thing, I, w I was talking to a rabbi about this and the dating in the Talmud, is it like in the first century BC, not first century AD? But he said the reason for that was because they were trying to sort of conceal that they were writing this stuff so that they wouldn't get killed by the church. Which oh, is no, 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 I don't, no, that's not right. Okay. That's not right. That's, that can't be right. People sure. who are constructing the Talmud were not worried about being killed by the Christians. Uh, and the Talmud, you know, the Talmud's in the fifth century. So, I mean, it's not going to be a reliable source of information for someone living 500 years earlier. But it does show that there was this Jewish idea floating around about Jesus. And you're right, the, the pagan critic Celsus also suggests this idea. Um, and there, so the, the deal is that if he has this kind of strange birth and people think that maybe he's born illegitimately, then people come up with the idea that his father was a Roman, uh, which is a which is an idea that, by the way, that is replicated in the life of Brian, <laughs> the Monty Python life of Brian, nice. where Brian turns out his father was a Roman. That's so, so true. That's spoofing. That's spoofing on this idea about Jesus. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. But the re but the logic of it is that his father, Pantera, in this tradition was uh, the word Pantera sounds a lot like the word for virgin in uh, Greek. It, the word for virgin is Parthenos, and this is 
panthera. And so it's out there. There's similar words. Mm -hmm. And so what people tend to think is the Christians were declaring that he's born of the Parthenos and the opponents say he's born of panthera, <laughs> which meant and they said that was a Roman soldier. And so so it's I think it's I think that there is almost no way that the historical Jesus was born, uh, that his father was a Roman soldier. And the reason I think there's no way that that can be true is because he almost certainly came from Nazareth. Nazareth was this little hamlet that nobody had ever heard of. There were not Romans in that area at all, let alone in a little hamlet. That we imagine them because we watch too many movies. That the Romans are every corner in the first century, and the Jews are oppressed by these Romans who are everywhere. The Romans were not everywhere. They weren't even in Israel. They were, I mean, Pilate kept a group, a small group of soldiers on the seacoast in Caesarea uh, for his protection and things. But the, the armies were in Syria. And so there were not Roman soldiers floating around Galilee. <laughs> and so the idea that and if she was from Nazareth, she almost certainly never would have left Nazareth. And these, these are dirt poor people who never travel in this time. And so um, I don't think there's any way his father was a Roman soldier. <laughs> I think that's just a later legend. Sure. And because and another thing, even if that was true, then how I, I think it's completely ridiculous to say that there was two Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth that were that were hung on Passover for leading Israel astray. Well, well, what, 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 your, what your Talmudic friend would say is that they were actually talking about our Jesus, but they were doing it in code. Right. And so he's not saying there were two different ones. He's saying there's one, but that they're doing it in code. The code right. thing, it just doesn't work for the Talmud. Well, that's what I'm saying. Some, sometimes you hear people say, well, that's a different Jesus. Well, it, yeah. It, no, it, I know. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Including right. some Muslims, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> that's evidence. Yeah. And so, and so then you get to the the whole aspect of his father Joseph, and I just recently found this out recently because I I was I wasn't really up to speed on the cr chronology of the text. So you got Paul's letters, and then you got Mark, I think, is the first gospel. Yeah. Well, in all of those writings, there's no mention of Joseph until you get to Luke and Matthew, which are the gospels that have the genealogy in them. So you get so you'll have people come up and say they're using their they're inventing this Joseph character to give uh, Jesus a Davidic bloodline because both of the genealogies have Joseph and the genealogy being related to David. Uh, do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think Joseph was, do you, is a reason why he wasn't mentioned in any of Paul's epistles? No. So I don't, I'm not sure if Paul knew anything about Jesus birth. The only thing he says about his birth is that, that Christ was born of a woman. <laughs> Galatians 4 4. Not particularly helpful datum. Right. Have that. I mean, you're born of a woman. So, right. but that's all he says. So, we don't know if he knows about a virgin birth or anything about his parents or anything like that. We don't know. Uh, and it may, my sense is that Paul was not going around trying to find out information about the historical Jesus because he just wasn't interested in that for weird reasons. It's another discussion. Um, Mark does not mention um, Joseph. He doesn't, um, but uh, it, there are suggestions in Mark that that if Mark did know about Jesus' father, that Jesus' father was dead at this time, by, and when Jesus was an adult. Uh, that would be typical because in, in the world at that time, most girls, they were girls, got married when they hit puberty, so around 13 or so. And the men tended to be much older. And so when, when a child had grown up, most men were dead. <laughs> and so, um, so that's probably the case there. Was his name really Joseph? Uh, I think probably so. I don't know why somebody would make it up. Ma Matthew and Luke both have the name Joseph. And throughout the tradition, wherever he's named, he's called Joseph. So he's probably just named Joseph. There's nothing significant about it. It's just his name. I don't think he was invented in order to give Jesus a Davidic lineage because I don't think whoever this was, whoever his father was, I assume it's somebody named Joseph, would have had any idea what his lineage was. Um, I mean, People today sent, tend to think that Jews had like Ancestor.com or something where they, actually, <laughs> they could just look it up and find out, you know, they didn't keep records. <laughs> they couldn't even read. <laughs> and so they, they, there are no records. And so whoever, so Matthew and Luke both do give a genealogy of tracing Joseph back to, uh, to King David and to, to Abraham. Um, but these genealogies differ from each other. So that they're not getting from the same source, and you don't need somebody named Joseph to have the genealogy. You just call him something else. It doesn't matter what you call him, as long as you got the genealogy going back to David. I don't think the genealogies can be at all accurate, but um, but you know that's not why Joseph was invented. 
And I'm pretty sure that if he was a line- he had a lineage going back to David, I don't think he'd be poor in Nazareth. I think he'd probably be people. If he, if they, I'm saying, if they knew this, not like they're figuring oh, this out. Oh no, no, that's a good point. But I think actually, it's it's a good point because it's getting to something that I think is right, which is that people are wondering how could somebody from that, like this little hamlet who must have grown up in abject poverty, how how could he be the king of the Jews? Right. And and so and so that's why you have to have this link to David, that he's actually sure. David's descendant, uh, because otherwise it doesn't really make sense that God's great Messiah is born in Nazareth. <laughs> Interesting. So do we do we have any physical evidence or any primary sources going to the life during the time of his life of Jesus? No. Or, no. Okay. I, that's that's my know, we don't we don't for. I suppose we don't have for anybody in that period, except for, um, um, well, the, the high priest Caiaphas, the only thing we have, you know, so he's like the head, he's the, he's like the most important. He's like the, uh, you know, he's the president of the U.S. I mean, he's like the guy. Yeah. Um, we didn't have anything uh, from, uh, from or about him until a few years ago. They found a bone box, an ossuary that had his name, his name inscribed on it. Oh, wow. wasn't described as scratched on there and so for hundreds and hundreds of years the most important person in jesus at jesus time <laughs> in in his day we just that's all we got so you wouldn't expect anything for anybody really because of the nature of our surviving sources we just don't have information like that okay so and now the big question the empty tomb what are your thoughts on this is this a um, sort of constructed narrative or is there any truth to this is there any anything pointing to this i have a high i have a highly controversial view on this for scholars it may not be controversial for your um for your listeners um i for years and years and years i thought that there must have been an empty tomb that whatever however even when i was an atheist i thought you know whatever how however you might want to explain it we just have overwhelming evidence that there's the tomb was empty and now i don't think so um I, about 10 years ago, I started looking into it. And what I, what I looked into, I mean, you know, of course, our only stories about it are in the, are in, in the Gospels. Um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about Jesus not being in the tomb. Paul doesn't say anything about it. The others don't say anything about the tomb being empty. They do talk about Jesus being raised from the dead. They talk about people, him appearing to people, but they don't talk about a tomb being empty. Right. And people are so used to the tomb being empty, they just assume it happened. So what I did is I looked up, so I was interested in what Romans did to crucified victims. Hmm. When you crucify somebody, what happens to the body? And uh, I looked up every reference I could find in every Greek and Latin author from the ancient world about crucifixion. Wow. And most of them don't say anything about what happens to the remains, but when they do talk about the remains, what they always, what they virtually always say is that the bodies were left on their crosses to uh, to decompose on the crosses so that the birds would eat them um, as part of the punishment. And the idea was that in the ancient world, pe- people today, everybody today wants a decent burial today. Uh, but in the ancient world, this was a really, really big thing. You had to have a decent burial. And the Romans basically were flipping them the bird and saying, yeah, you're going to rot on the cross. And then, you know, and so when they, once they rotted on the cross for, you know, a couple of weeks, they <laughs> let them bury them or something. But, but so I don't think Jesus could have been buried on the day he was crucified because Romans didn't do that. And there are only a couple of exceptions to that that are really highly exceptional. So I talk about this actually in my book, um, in my book, How Jesus Became God. I marshal the evidence and I try to show that, that Jesus almost certainly was not buried on that day. And so I think that there wasn't an empty tomb. I don't think anybody even knew about a tomb. I don't think it was a tomb. I think a couple weeks later, they threw him in a ditch or something. Like they do with most people. That's interesting. And do you think the Romans would have not let a Jew like Joseph of Arimathea, for example, you don't think they would let him just come and, hey, I'm going to take him down. Is it okay with you guys? <laughs> I'm laughing. We don't want to punish him. Right. I mean, it's like saying, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> No. Yeah. <laughs> whole, well, I, Rome, I started laughing as I'm saying it because it sounds so ridiculous. Just people don't understand just walk how in there and like, hey, I'm going to take this guy down from the. Is it okay with you guys? Is it all right? I mean, Romans were, um, especially Roman administrators, had to had to work with a very iron fist. Right. 
because they they and Pilate was known for being completely ruthless. He didn't give a damn what the Jewish authorities. He of course didn't want to riot, uh, and so he he took care of things when things were getting out of hand. But that's it happened twice in his career, and it's when you have hundreds of people lining up in protest. It's not when this this Jesus that he's just crucified is a nobody. Nobody's heard of him. He's like this. He's he's come from Galilee. He doesn't even live in Jerusalem. Doesn't have any family there. Doesn't have any. It doesn't have. And so you know the idea that some guy went up to Pilate and said, "Oh, can, can I have the body?" Oh, sure, take him. No, it didn't work like it just didn't work like that. So I don't think there was an empty tomb. But I say that is controversial. Schol most scholars think I'm like really. Where do yeah. you think that legend comes from then? If if it's yeah yeah. No, that's that's the question then. Why do you have an empty tomb? The reason you have an empty tomb is because the early Christians believed that Jesus got physically raised from the dead. Um, they thought that because several of the early Christians uh, had visions of him. I mean, I think they really did have visions of him. I think, you know, people like, I think Peter uh, probably and Mary probably and later Paul and, and others, maybe others, at least those three, I think almost certainly thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards. And in that day, if you're a Jew in that day, if you think you see somebody alive after they're dead, that means they got raised from the dead. Their, their body's been raised from the dead. The tomb was a story that developed over time to explain they really was bodily raised from the dead. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'm thinking about all the writers of the time period. You got Philo, you got Seneca, you got Plutarch later on, you got, and there's, I could probably list like 20 voluminous authors who were Pliny the Elder wrote an encyclopedia in that area. He wrote about the Essenes. He wrote about miracles. He wrote about prodigal births. And they don't seem to under, they, they see, it seems that they don't know who Jesus is yet. And my question, my question is, do you, is, is, is this such a small group of followers that is this, what is this what's going on? It's just so small that no one knows who it is until later on. And it just slowly grows up. I think the problem is that people, um, People think that, you know, they say, well, if the Gospels are right, you know, he's feeding 5,000 men at one time. That must, that's not kind of the women and children. There must be 13,000 people there. And there are crowds everywhere. You can't even get into a city. There's so many crowds. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people. And, if, you know, so since, Phy since Philo doesn't mention him or Pliny the Elder, well, that shows that he didn't exist. <laughs> oh, what? It shows that he didn't have all those followers. Right. That's a good <laughs> so, point. So you have to ask yourself, the the high priest when Jesus was like a teenager, a very important, very the, the key figure in all of, uh, of Israel at the time was Annas, the father of Caiaphas. How many times is he mentioned by Philo or by Pliny the Elder or by, by Seneca or by Plutarch? Or this is the most person person in that, that entire country. How Ooh, often is he mentioned? He's never mentioned. Why would point. they mention him? So let alone some itinerant preacher from Galilee who's got, you know, he's got a small following and ended up becoming the most important person in the history of the Western world. <laughs> right, right, right. But but he wasn't at the time. So it doesn't mean he didn't exist. It meant he wasn't he wasn't the the gospels have exaggerated his importance during his day. It's impossible to exaggerate his importance now. <laughs> you yeah. have over two billion people who worship him. <laughs> so, like, who else you got that going for him? But, but at the time, no. That's a really so good point. I mean, you wouldn't. You abs. No historian would expect those people to mention him. That's a Just really good point. And and another thing I like to and I, people don't people don't realize is that paper, papyrus, parchment. This was not cheap and easy to find. You had to find a scribe who can write who's literate. Very rare. You also had to sometimes you had to take animal skins and do some sort of really intense process to make paper. So like, this is not like some guy can be following Jesus around and pulls out a pencil on a paper and just starts writing stuff down. This is the process yeah. you need a, you need yeah. funding yeah. for. Yeah. But no, his disciples were not taking notes. <laughs> right. And that's good. And, that, and I think that's really important to point out. And when yeah. you talk about yeah. mythicism versus historicism, uh, the crust is character that's mentioned, I think in Tacitus, I think Suetonius. 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 Is is this the same person as Jesus, or is this a different? Because I hear that he might be a Roman slave, or something like that. What's yeah, that? it's hard to know. But Suetonius, Suetonius um, is writing about um, an action undertaken by Claudius, uh, who was a Roman emperor, 
um, about 30 years after Jesus, 25 years after Jesus' death. And um, Claudius had uh, expelled the Jews from Rome because of some some uprisings of some kind. And he and Suetonius, who's writing 60 years later, 70 years later, says that Cla Claudius did this at, because these riots were these riots and the riots were instigated by Crestus, C H R E S T U S. And um, for a long time, some people thought a lot of people thought that this is a reference to Christ, Christos. Uh, it'd be a misspelling, but that Suetonius just probably didn't understand that he meant Christos. And the idea there is that. Um, that you had in Rome at the time, you had Christians who were following, who were Jew, Jews who were following Jesus as the Messiah, Jews who were not following Jesus as the Messiah, and they're arguing it out, and it's leading to fighting in the streets. And so he, kicked, he said, out of hell with all of you, he kicks them all out of Rome. That, that, that was the theory. And a lot of people still think that. A lot of Roman historians often think that. So, you know, it's not a religious thing. It's just Roman historians often think that. Other people think that Crestus is just the name of the person who started these riots. Uh, and Crestus is a it's uh, it is a trip. It is a name that is sometimes assigned to slaves uh, in the period. And so we don't know. We don't know what the situation is. We don't know whether it's riots over whether Jesus is the Messiah or if it's some Jewish slave or some other person named Crestus, who for some reason is a controversial figure and that's led to some kind of riots. Don't really know. That's a good, good point. The last thing I want to touch on is the Josephus interpolation, because we, we he writes about brother of Jesus in one area of his of his writing, but he also writes about Jesus who was called the Christ. And my question is, how much of that do you think is interpolation? How much of that do you think was originally written by Josephus? So it's a debated issue, and of course, a mythicist want to throw the whole thing out, um, and Usually, you know, usually you have to like wonder what, I mean, you have to look at people's motives for wanting to do things because if, if Josephus mentions Jesus, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> it's not an insurmountable problem because you could still say he's made up. But but um, Josephus is a historian of the first century and he records a lot of events about a lot of people and uh, a number of people also named Jesus. I mean, Jesus was a common name. And so there are other people he talked about named Jesus. But there are two references to Jesus in the writings of Josephus in his book, The Antiquities. The Antiquities is a 20 volume work that uh, traces the history of the Jewish people from Adam and Eve <laughs> up, to, up to Josephus' day. That's a great history. It's like writing the history, <laughs> the history of Americans starting with Adam and Eve. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, so, um, but he he has two two things he says about Jesus in chapter twenty the last the second reference is it's a story about somebody named James who is the brother of uh, of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Um, Josephus seems there to be referring back to somebody he's already referred to because he's telling you which Jesus it is, right. which of the Jesus which it's the Jesus the one that's called the Messiah. In chap in book eighteen. He has a he actually has a paragraph that he devotes to Jesus, where he says that at this time there was a man, if you can call him a man named Jesus, and you know, he was the Messiah. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about his teach his teaching, his followers, and that he um he got in trouble with the leaders of the Jewish people who handed him over to the Roman authorities, who then uh, executed him uh when Tiberius was the emperor. And so he he has this this paragraph that describes kind of the nuts and bolts that you would get, probably get from the gospels that Jesus was a teacher did amazing things and got crucified because, and so, so uh, it, it seems to confirm the basic, the very, very, very basic outline of what we know about Jesus historically and from, and from the early Christian sources. And the question is, um, did Josephus write that? And if he wrote it, did he write all of it or some of it, or how do we know? And so the, the, the widespread view, I think still widespread view, is that Josephus wrote most of that, but he certainly didn't write all of it. <laughs> because in this paragraph, he says Jesus was the Messiah, and he says that he was raised from the dead on the third day to fulfill the scriptures. <laughs> it's like he just writes the Nicene Creed just right there. Just exactly. Inserts it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. He wants to the Nicene Creed. It's like, so, but. You know, we know Josephus never became a follower of Jesus. He, we have his autobiography, so we know he never became a follower of Jesus. And so it looks like the, the deal is that Josephus was a, a, a persona non grata among Jews throughout most of history because he was thought to be a traitor to the Jewish cause during the Jewish war. 
Um, and um, and uh, for reasons I don't need to get into, but he tells it in his own writing. He tells right. him what he did. But he was a turncoat in their opinion. So Jews did not preserve his writings. Christians, his writings are preserved by Christian scribes. And the general thought is that what happened is Josephus wrote that section about Jesus, and he just says some basic things about him. Some people called him the Messiah. He 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 did weird things, <laughs> amazing deeds, and he, he said to have done amazing deeds. He he teach he he taught, and they got in trouble with the law, and they crucified. Him. And so, um, but then the scribe who's copying this wants to make sure you understand who this is. Right. Jesus called the, he was the Messiah, you know, and that he <laughs> uh, and that he was raised from the dead. And according to Phil's the scripture, you know, so he adds a couple lines as scribes do, right. uh, and that and that would explain why you have that reference in chapter twenty to Jesus, the one who's called the Messiah. In other words, the guy I just was talking about a couple of books ago. Uh, yeah. So that, that's my view is that that Josephus probably did say something about that, and um, but not not everything that's there now. In fact, if it, if it wasn't for the other verse about going back to the book eighteen about James, if that wasn't there, then I think they'd have a stronger case. But the fact that they're both there and they're connected sort yeah. of makes it seem like you can't really interplay both. And another thing, I'm going to I'm going to say this, and this is going to bother a lot of mythicists, but this is true. A lot of mythicists will say that verse looks like it's inserted in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't belong where it belongs. But if you actually look at book 18, it opens up about Pilate. So where else would you hear about Jesus other than right next to Pilate, the guy who kills him? It kind of does fit. I'm not going to lie. I I would say it does fit where it does. I, I mean, you hear the, 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 the story being told right before it gets into there is a man named Jesus, a wise man. It's about Pilate bringing statues into Jerusalem and then the Jews rebelling and saying, we don't want these statues, kill us all. And he's like, okay, fine, I won't bring them. And then it gets into, there was a wise man named Jesus. If you're Josephus writing this, you're thinking about Pilate and the things he was doing in Jerusalem. Obviously, you're going to think about, oh yeah, by the way, there was that guy, Jesus, that we killed. He made a big deal. He made a big stink about this one. Of course, you're going to put that there. So I think it does fit. I don't know what you think about that. It's yeah, like, yeah, I think, I think I don't th I don't think the idea that it just looks like it's been thrown in. I don't think that's right. I agree with that. The other thing is that if you think that Christian that uh, it's an interpolation, it's really hard to explain that thing in book twenty. Why didn't they Why didn't they go for it? Why didn't Why whoever's interpreting? Why didn't they say uh, this the brother of Jesus, the Messiah? You know, and then have a, another. Why not say something about him? instead of just an elusive thing it's elusive as if an author is just referring back to something it's not like an interpolation where they could have said you know uh oh yeah james he's the brother of the messiah the son of god who uh you know who's worshiping and adored but you know they would have said something so yeah. and this has been great and just if you want to give my audience any direction on where to go to find some more of your stuff in your your uh yeah your seminars so a couple things. One is that I've started doing courses that uh, people can uh, purchase online that deal with all sorts of things. Uh, and if they just go to barterman.com slash courses, they can see the ones I've done already and that I'm going to be doing. And anyone who's interested in the stuff, I deal with this kind of material all the time on my blog. Uh, so the Bart Ehrman blog, I post five times a week. I've been doing it. This is my 10th year. I've done it for every week. 10 years old. and so uh and i answer questions i answer every question i get i deal with comments and so uh it's a really i i use it to raise money for charity there's a small membership fee and it all all the money goes to 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 important charities so i think people if people can if they could look at that it'd be great and the links in the description and in the comments so click on that and you have just attained true gnosis You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over it.